thank you for coming today to honor the life of Bishop Lawton Wayne Hicks. And he carried that distinguished title with honor. But for me, he was always pastor. He was always honorable and professional. And when he stood to represent the family of God, he represented them with that honor. As you can look and tell, I ate with him about four days a week. It didn't matter if we was in a restaurant or if we was in the church. My pastor represented the kingdom of God the same way. And I want to thank you today for coming and honoring his family and honoring him. He deserves that honor. And from the Hicks family, I'd like to say to you, because I know there were so many that reached out, so many that prayed, so many that done everything within their power to comfort them, to encourage them. And I know this family, I know they greatly appreciate that. And I greatly appreciate that as well. So once again, thank you for coming and showing this honor. And by the time that these gentlemen following me get done, for those of you that didn't know him, maybe as well as others, you too will know a great man. Also, I'd like to say that uh, for many that are watching all over the world, people all over the world knew Bishop Hicks and appreciated him. And there'll be a lot of people watching by YouTube and social media. If you're watching and this stream goes out, you can wait a few hours and it should download in its entirety so you can see this service. And I just wanted to let the people that's out there watching know that because I want them to be able to hear what's said today about Bishop Wayne Hicks. Let's pray. Father, thank you today, God, for your grace, for your love, and your mercy. Father, I thank you for a man that has passed the torch. God has passed the torch to his family. God, that he has shown them the life of holiness, the life of a servant that has loved God and served with all of his heart. God, that which he has passed to them today is worth more and more, much more valuable than gold or anything that could be achieved on this earth. He has lived a life before them, and God's shown them the way to eternal life. He's preached it. He's lived it. And God, I know his heart. That Lord, he wanted to see his family serve you and follow the footsteps and to follow this tradition that he has left, that, God, that they would love you and serve you. So, Lord, we thank you today for every individual that has come this way to show tribute and to show honor and respect. I pray for those that will follow me today, that they would speak under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and, God, that they would speak the words that you would be pleased with words of comfort to this family, encouragement to this congregation, because that is what he represented. Now, God, minister by your spirit and have your way, and we thank you and we honor you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have walked through the valley of the shadow of death. I have breathed what surely could be my last breath. But as long as I hold 
my Savior's hand. Oh, I do it all over again. I'd walk that same road if he walks with me or over and over he has proven to be my healer redeemer companion and friend and as long as he's with me i do it all over again. He was light in the darkness when i felt so alone when my heart was heavy he gave me a song now some places he's led me i don't understand oh but i do it all over again. I'd walk that same road if he walks with me for over and over. He has proven to be my healer, my redeemer, my companion, and my friend, and I do it all over again. He's my healer, my redeemer, my companion, and my friend. And as long as he's with me, oh, as long as he's with me, I know I do it all over again. I do it all over again. Along with Pastor Bobby, <clears throat> let me just thank all of you for being here today as we celebrate uh, the life of a great man. On behalf of the General Executive Board and the General Committee and all of the Congregational Holiness Churches around the world, let me simply say thank God for the life of Bishop Wayne Hicks. Wayne made a difference. Wayne not only impacted our denomination in a positive way, but the larger body of Christ. In fact, his influence reached to other organizations and other denominations that are represented here today with us. And the world is a better place because of Wayne Hicks. Wayne was born on December the 4th, 1946 in Aiken, South Carolina. He was preceded in death by his parents, Bishop Cullen Hicks, and this is one of those cases where only time in the history of our organization where father and son uh, have held the highest office in our church, Bishop Hicks. And when you say Bishop Hicks, now you have to specify which one, uh, Brother Cullen or Brother Wayne, but 
his dad preceded him in death as long as well as his mom, Sister Marge. And then there was also a great-grandson, Memphis, that preceded Wayne. Wayne and Cheryl were married on January the 21st, 1966. And the following year, y'all got thrust into the pastoral ministry. So they have spent 54 years um, in ministry together. During those 54 years, Wayne served as the associate pastor in Graniteville at what is now the Christian Heritage Church. He served as the pastor of the Corinth Church, the Bethel Temple Church, the first church here in Gainesville, and then he is, of course, the founding pastor of New Haven where we are assembled here today. When he died, he was also serving as the pastoral care pastor at the Jefferson Church. He's had a long fruitful ministry. Into Wayne and Cheryl's home, there were born three children, Susan and Darren and John Michael. As those uh, children grew older and married, they blessed uh, Wayne and Cheryl with grandchildren, Austin and Brittany, Logan, Tiffany, Lauren, Noah, Carson, and Cooper. And then there's that fourth generation, If there's anything better than grandchildren, it's great-grandchildren. William and Ansley, Hayson, Cohen, Peyton, and Jade. And Wayne is also survived by one sister, Julianne. And of course, there's a host of other family members and friends that Wayne made a difference in their life. I first met Wayne back in the early 70s, uh, shortly after he came to pastor at the Corinth Church. I had met Wayne before, but it was during his term there in the, at Corinth, just outside of Royston, Georgia. I was already involved in youth ministry at that time. It was that that kind of served as a catalyst to bring um, our life together, and we began to see each other more and more after that. When Wayne became the pastor at Bethel Temple, Um, It was through Royal Rangers, another youth ministry, that our relationship began to just get closer. And uh, it's while we were there that um, Darren earned the gold medal of achievement, the highest award that a young boy could earn uh, in the Royal Ranger ministry. And that happened while uh, Wayne was there at um, Bethel Temple, and our relationship just continued to grow. But it was during the times here in Gainesville, when Wayne was pastor at the first church and then here when he founded and organized this church, that Wayne and I had just numerous opportunities to serve on quite a few different boards and committees. And and Wayne became one of my dearest friends. I loved Wayne so very much. I served with Wayne 22 years uh, on our general executive board. For those who are here that serve in leadership, Uh, There are times when people think that you never have any difficulties to deal with, but that's um, sadly not true. But Wayne was always a voice of wisdom and stability uh, in our meetings when we would have to deal with uh, some situations that we would rather not deal with. Wayne served our denomination from the time he was just a young man. Like many of us, he got his start preaching youth camps and And uh, those youth camps would open other doors of uh, ministry for him throughout his life. Wayne would serve in so many different capacities and so many different positions over his life. We know that he served as choir director in at least 25 camp meetings. I suspect there was more than that. He helped organize the North Georgia Pentecostal Fellowship, which is an organization, a multi-county organization, where the various Pentecostal pastors in those counties would get together monthly and just fellowship. Wayne was one of the founders of that. Wayne preached in two uh, citywide crusades in Lincoln County. Uh, Wayne served as a member of the advisory board at Emanuel College. Wayne served on the executive committee of a crusade that was held in Haversham County that was sponsored by the Billy Graham Association. Wayne served on the clergy staff at the Northeast Georgia Medical Center in several different uh, positions. Wayne served on the board of directors at Beulah Heights Bible College. He served on the North Georgia Presbytery for four years. He served on the North Georgia Campground Committee for 37 years. 
Wayne preached camp meetings across the Congregational Holiness Church. He preached a camp meeting for the Pentecostal Free Will Baptist Church. And he preached revivals in those above-mentioned organizations as well as the Pentecostal Holiness Church. And I'm sure probably in the Church of God as well. Wayne served on the General Executive Board for a total of 37 years. I don't think anyone has served longer than that. If they did, it would have been some of our earliest founding leaders, but I don't think that any of them equaled that record. I think Wayne would have the record of serving for 37 years, the longest anyone served on the General Executive Board. He was elected as our General Superintendent on August the 27th, almost four months ago. And I was so pleased when that happened because to me it was the fitting conclusion to a ministry that has been lived with dignity and, with, uh, and, and character. His whole life prepared him for those four months that he has served us, and he served us with distinction during those four months. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 the Bible says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. I think that sometimes that that verse gets used too lightly in some funerals, but not here, not today. That passage of Scripture certainly applies to Bishop Wayne Hicks. He fought a good fight. He kept the faith, and he finished the course. He is enjoying what he preached about for all of these years. And one of these days, I'm going to get to see my friend again. Cheryl, Susan, Darren, John Michael, all of the family, you were so blessed. I mean, there's just not many Wayne Hickses in this world. You were so blessed. Thank you for sharing him with us for all of these years. Our world's a better place because of Wayne Hicks. Early yesterday morning, as I was thinking about the part that I had been asked to do in this service, I thought about, you know, around 525 on the 23rd, Heaven started rejoicing, and they welcomed Wayne home. I, I wonder what scenes like that look like. I mean, here was a great soldier coming home. Heaven welcomed him home. But what I thought about early yesterday morning was this. On the 23rd, around 5.25 a.m., they welcomed him home. I'm sure somebody's done this before. I never have done it. But I would like for us to reciprocate. I would like for us to respond from down here. And I want you to stand across this place if you're able. And I want you to give a great big applause for Wayne Hicks and the life and the ministry that he lived. Love you, Wayne. I'll see you on the other side. Soul that's sin sick and make it white as 
upon the waters and I can't call a rage and see oh Miss Susan, if there's one thing that he loved more than anything in this world is hear you sing. He loved to hear you sing. Um, my name is Pastor Nick Dalton. I had the honor and privilege of being Pastor Wayne's youth pastor for almost four years. And um, because I, I'm afraid I'm going to get too emotional, I, I wrote down everything, and I'm, I'm normally point by point, but I'm going to do a lot of reading just simply because I'm, I'm just, I want to be able to get through this for, for that man right there. Um, when I think of Pastor Wayne Hicks, I think of the word legacy. Because legacy is what you leave behind when you're gone. We all have a legacy that we're going to leave. And that's something that we can all, in retrospect, look at. As even right now, that saying that at some point in our life, we will be remembered for something. It's amazing to think about it, but I only knew... Pastor Wayne Hicks for eight years of my life, but in eight years, he left a legacy that I will never forget. He made a mark on me. So I'm just going to talk about my friend and my pastor who started off as just an employer, and he became a spiritual father and a true father in the faith, and how he taught me so many lessons along the way, and I'm, I'm going to narrow all of them down to four if you can stand to hear me talk for a little bit longer. But it's things that I think he would want you to know. The first lesson was this. He, um, he allowed me to start full-time ministry. It was, his, um, it was his opportunity that he gave me. He offered me a job as a youth pastor, 
And as a matter of fact, it may sound like it's a little crass, but I wanted you to know that he wants you to know I made good money as a youth pastor. He wanted you to know that. But I earned that money. I replaced every bulb in the chandelier in this room. And I almost had a funeral on my behalf. We almost had several times. John, you know how that feels, don't you? Yeah, we, we know how that feels. James, you're the same way. Um, the first lesson I learned from him is you need to take care of the people that you employ and the people that you pastor because you create faithful followers just simply by caring for them. And so by the time I left New Haven Church, I found out I was the highest paid youth pastor in Gainesville, Georgia. He would want you to know that. (laughs) Second lesson, I found out we were very different. He loved to be precise. Matter of fact, if you look at this document, this paper right here, you can see that he has how many years, months, and days of his life. If it were up to me, I would just say I've been around 75 years or so, something like that. He loved to be precise. My version of on time was different than his version of on time. He was 15 minutes early to everything. I was 15 minutes late to everything. We both thought that we were on time, but he lovingly taught me I was wrong. His sermons were all in chronological order, perfectly memorized to the minute, which, by the way, was around 28 minutes for those of you that don't know. My sermons barely made a piece of paper. Sometimes they were scribbled on napkins, and they lasted anywhere from, wow, that was short, to, man, when's this preacher going to hush? That's how long they lasted. He lovingly taught me a better way, and now that I'm a senior pastor, I'm thankful, (laughs) and my congregation is thankful. He was not afraid to work hard. I saw him in his office for hours preparing that 28-minute message, knowing that the Holy Spirit would be present, but preparing like the responsibility of man's eternal destination rested upon his words. He taught me structure and preparation of a sermon is like giving the Holy Spirit a sharpened tool to do the work that only the Holy Spirit can do. So the second lesson that he taught me was that two people as different as the two of us, God made both of us to do the same purpose, even though it may be in different ways. Next, he introduced me to Gainesville. He introduced me to the who's who of Hall County, a big uppity town of of Gainesville and Hall County. He took me to the bridge that goes nowhere, which I still don't understand to this day. He took me for the first time to the greatest restaurant in the world, Long Street, where he never paid for a meal because that was Mr. Tim's way of honoring this man of God. He taught me that I didn't know it all. First time, (laughs) my first hospital visit I ever did, we're in the truck on the way uh, to the hospital, and I'm, I'm the grandson of Dennis Kiesler, the great hospital visitor himself. If there's some natural genes inside of me, I should be really, really naturally good at hospital visits. And as we were going there, I said, Pastor, who are we going to go see? He said, we're going to go see Robbie Benton, uh, and, and that person was in the hospital. I said, well, what's he look like? And we kept going and going and going, and I kept saying, well, what's he look like? What's he going to say? Hey, do I know him? Do I know who this person is? Robbie Benton, Robbie Benton, Robbie Benton. We get off the elevator. We walk in the room, and Robbie Benton was a female, was not a male. And Miss Robbie, if you're here, he laughed about that the entire way home. He laughed about it the whole way home. He taught me that. I always asked him, I said, Pastor, how do you know how long to stay in a, in a, in a, in a room with somebody at a hospital? How do, how do you know how long's too long, how short's too short? He always had a, a lifesaver or a cert or something he put in his mouth. He said, by the time that lifesaver's dissolved, you need to be saying a prayer and getting out of there. <laughs> I always wondered how long. The third thing he taught me of that lesson was he taught me to love people in the simplest way, like phone calls, hospital visits, written letters. And he taught me to love a city that God had called me to, which is what my wife and I have done for the past four or five years. I told him more things. I confided in him, not because I meant to, but because he simply listened. He was the very example of quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry, as Bishop Wilson just remarked. Just before we moved to Jefferson, he called me into his office to tell me goodbye. That was the first time I'd ever seen him cry. I knew then that he was a compassionate shepherd who would be my friend and teacher until his own death. My wife and I came to a church. Now, again, I'm telling you what he would want you to know. My wife and I came to a church in Jefferson, Georgia, that was running 
100 people in average attendance. And just before COVID, we were running 1,200 people in four short years. We started out as a church that was underfunded and over budget, and now we are so blessed that this year we have given almost $250,000 to the community while adding staff and about to build a new sanctuary. And in five years, we have seen 719 people give their life to Jesus. I say those things not to brag on myself and not to brag on the Jefferson Church. I say that to brag on him. Every single salvation that happens at the Jefferson Church is a direct result of Bishop Wayne Hicks. Every recommitment, every life change, every car that's given away, every family that's blessed, every building that's built is a direct result of my friend and my father, Pastor Wayne Hicks. The final story and the final lesson, I came to his house He was sick and had been sick for quite some time, but I came to him and this new project that we're doing, this new sanctuary that we're building and the old mill that we're renovating down in Jefferson, I told him about in this new project and I I brought him the plans. He was a builder and he loved to look at the plans and the design, so I made a copy just for him to, to great expense actually, and I gave him the plans and I laid it out on his dining room table and I was so, I was so shining, I was just glowing with what was going to happen and what God had done in four or five short years and I was just so excited to tell him and to honestly as a as even as a spiritual son showing his spiritual father what was getting prepared to happen and I was inspired and I was prepared to tackle the task of filling a sanctuary of 500 seats and I just thought that was amazing 500 seats pastor can you imagine I'm going to have a sanctuary of 500 seats he did what he always did he let me talk and when I was done, I looked at him, he sat back, and he said, son, that sanctuary is too small. And I said, pastor, that's 500 seats. That's a big responsibility for a pastor to have to fill, 500 seats. He said, son, that sanctuary is too small. It needs to be at least 1,000 seats. Lesson number four, he taught me to be a dream. He taught me to dream bigger. He believed in me more than I even believed in myself sometimes. And I can tell you today that our sanctuary will seat over a 1,000 people when it's built because of his dreams and because of his confidence in myself and my wife. Dr. Matt Turner said it best. He said, Bishop Wayne Hicks was a consummate pastor for the decade. But to me, to James, to John, to Tony, to Darren, and to so many others, he was more than just a pastor. He was a shepherd, a guide a leader, a mentor, and for me personally, he was my spiritual father. I sat right there where my crew was sitting right there. I sat there one Sunday evening when he was up here preaching a sermon, and he went to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And as I would listen, I would also read scripture while he was trying to make his points, and I was trying to find my own sermons and his sermons, and that's basically how I came up with every good sermon I ever had was because I basically stole them from him. And in Deuteronomy 31, it's Moses talking to Joshua, the father talking to the son. And the two words, the two verses that he continually says to him is what Pastor Wayne would say to me. He said, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you, do not be afraid, and do not be discouraged. Pastor Wayne loved to sing. And as he came home for the final time, he sang a few songs at his piano, which I heard wore him out when it was all said and done, but he told me over the phone, he said, I felt like doing that for so long, Nick. And so I just want to briefly sing a song, and you can sing with me if you'd like to. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. He shall forevermore endure, the saints and angels. Come on, sing it one more time. Oh, love of God, how rich and pure, 
How measureless and strong He shall forevermore endure The saints and angels Love you, Pastor Hicks. I'll see you one day. For those of you who don't know me, I had the privilege of being the son of Wayne Hicks. So these other guys have done a great job. I may not do this. Uh, I may not be able to hold it together as well, but he's told me for years, he would say, son, I want you to preach my funeral. (laughs) And then more recently, he would say, 
son, now I'm not going to live much longer. And I said, I don't know about that. And he said, no, I'm, I'm not. And he said, but I, I want you to preach my funeral. So that's why I'm up here, not because of any great things that I've gone on to accomplish or anything like that, but because of who I am, who's, who's I am is the reason. But I want to, on behalf of the family, say a very special thank you for all the calls, the texts, the flowers, and most of all the prayers that you have prayed for Dad through his sickness and the prayers that you've prayed for our family in recent days. I want to thank my parents' wonderful neighbors, in particular Mr. James Barber, that he always tells me he's 70 steps away and has been just wonderful to them. I want to say thank you to the EMTs and the staff of Northeast Georgia Medical Center that they have provided such great care to Dad uh, in recent times. I want to say a very special thank you to Memorial Park Funeral Home, not just for their service this week because they have been excellent, as, as they always are, but they have been a friend of my dad. All through the years, these last years, as long as they've been a funeral home in Gainesville, they have been a very special friend to Dad. And then I also want to say a thank you to New Haven Church for the meal that you provided our family and for the hospitality of opening up the church, the, this church that means that has a very special place to our family. Then I want to say a very special thank you to the general committee. I believe most of you gentlemen are up here. I want to say thank you to you for electing Dad to be the bishop. He served in a lot of capacities, and it was always a dream of his to get to be the bishop, but he knew his calling was a pastor, so he would never leave a church to move to Griffin. But you guys gave him the opportunity, and to all of you, I want to say thank you for 100% voting him in. Churches don't vote 100% a lot of times. And, uh, and you guys did that, and that meant a lot to him. He was, he was so proud, so proud, and I thank you for that opportunity. There's a famous eulogy that was given by Reverend Charles O'Donnell when uh, Newt Rockney, he was a famous uh, football coach at Notre Dame. And in 1930, Newt Rockney died in a plane crash. And uh, Notre Dame not being just a local fan of schools nationwide and maybe even some instances worldwide, people pull for them, although we don't here in the South. Uh, Newt Rockney is revered as one of the greatest coaches ever. And Reverend Charles O'Donnell gave this eulogy that later on became famous. And he said, in this holy week of Christ's passion and death, there has occurred a tragic event which accounts for our presence here today. Newt Rockney is dead. And who was he? Asked the President of the United States, who dispatched a personal message of tribute to his memory and comfort to his bereaved family. Asked the King of Norway, who sends a special delegation as his personal representatives to this solemn service. Asked the several state legislatures, now sitting, that have passed resolutions of sympathy and condolence. Ask the university senates, the civic bodies, and societies without number. Ask the bishops, the clergy, the religious orders that have sent assurances of sympathy and prayers. Ask the thousands of newspaper men whose labor of love in his memory has stirred a reading public of 125 million Americans. Ask men and women from every walk of life. Ask the children, the boys of America, ask any and all of these, who was this man whose death has struck the nations with dismay and has everywhere bowed heads in grief? When I heard this story of this eulogy, uh, sometime back, I thought of my dad. Dad preached over 1,300 funerals. And in, in my opinion, there was no better funeral preacher I think many of you who have been in funerals that he did, there, there was no one any better. I, I know I'm biased, but, but he, he was great at that. He really was. And he had this week, he had the events of this day planned out several years ago. Not just asking me, but, but talking to Nick and he talked to John. He talked to Tony Elrod, who has COVID and is not able to join us. But he, he had this planned out. And... I, I wondered to myself when I heard that eulogy of Newt Rockney, who is Wayne Hicks? 
And as I begin to think on that, there's a scripture in Acts chapter 11. That Acts chapter 11, 24, when they're talking about Barnabas. And this is what the Bible had to say about Barnabas. He said, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Barnabas, as far as I know, was the only man that the Bible called a good man. But I think it's very fitting for my dad. So many people have walked up to me and told me, and they didn't even know I had this scripture. And they would say, your dad was a good man. Some would say, your dad was a great man. And you know, I didn't disagree with one single one of them because he was a good man. But I began to think, thinking like he did, how he would type his outlines out. I've got a book full of his outlines here. And I think, how was he a good man? And I think, well, first of all, he was a good husband. That January of this coming year, he and my mother would have been married 55 years. Now, there was times they disagreed. If you were around them, you know that, and it it was kind of funny. But they they disagreed at times and and kind of, you know, butted heads a little bit. But who doesn't? 55 years, you know, you, you got the right to do that. But through those disagreements... It never escalated. I I never saw him take her down or her take him down. They they loved one another. They they did. And and he was a good husband. He, He loved her as Christ loved the church. He would have done anything for her. She was telling me the other night, she said, you know, she said, I, anything I sat there and anything I thought of, and I said, well, I, you know, I need this. And he would say, here, let me get it for you. And he would just pull out his phone and order it on Amazon, and then it would show up at the house. She, did, she didn't lack for anything as far as he was able. So he was a good husband. He was a good father. I can tell you about this firsthand. He provided for the three of us with with everything he was worth. He he loved to give us gifts. He he would give us gifts on times when you're supposed to give gifts, but then every once in a while, there would be a time he would just show up and just just give you something that you weren't looking for. Uh, The most recent for me being Sunday night. He had something that somebody had brought that he had got me, and he wanted me to have it because I've been cutting his grass for two years. And he wanted me to, and he, he called and wanted me to come over. And he said, he said, I want you to come over here. I said, oh, okay, I'll come over. So I went over to his house, and he said, now step out there on that porch. And he bought me a chainsaw. And it's going to come in real handy for that one tree I have in my yard. But... You know, I, he, he knew I needed a chainsaw because I would come in at his house. I'd be working around. I'd say, you know, if I had a chainsaw, I could fix that back there at that creek. And uh, he wanted me to have a chainsaw, and he got me a chainsaw and had my aunt and uncle to bring it up. And I, I went home. I, I was able to get off early Tuesday, which was a miracle. And, and I thought, I'm going to use that chainsaw because he was so proud to give it to me that I wanted to be able to tell him that I had used it. So I used that chainsaw, and I went over to his house and told him. He was just beaming because he loved to give gifts to his kids. I think back on the story of, I've told this a lot of times. I had a lot of fun with it. When coming up, you know, uh, I don't know if you know it, but Hole and his preachers don't make a lot of money. And uh, especially back in the day, they, they didn't make a lot of money. When you pastor a smaller church, the churches that he pastor did the best they could by him it was never a complaint on that but he did everything thing he could for us and sometimes we would be at night riding along in the car and the three of us in the back seat and uh, he would see us dozing off and he would say Cheryl the kids are asleep let's stop and get an ice cream And, you know, what he was really doing was getting three little heads to pop up. Say, I'm awake, I'm awake. Then we'd be elbowing each other. And so, you know, knowing funds were tight, we'd pull up somewhere. And my mama now, you know, she, she is the, the, 
the poster child for a mother that sacrifices and gives to her kids. And she, she knew and knowing money that was tight, and she would say, well, I, I don't really need an ice cream. I, I won't take one. And Dad would say, well, I'm not going to get an ice cream. I'm just going to take a bite of all y'all's. <laughs> so they would hand him the ice cream, and he would take it. And, you know, I, I mean, I, my teeth are very sensitive. My mother's teeth are sensitive. Dad never had sensitive teeth. And he would just take and just bite the top off that ice cream and then pass it to the back. And, you know, I was 16 years old. I got a job, went and had a little money of my own and went and got an ice cream. And they handed me that cone. And it had a big old thing ice cream over the cone. And I said, you mean they put it all the way up there all this time? Of course, of course, I'm kidding, you know, but he, he loved to give to us. He was a, a, a good father when one time I think of that when one of us went missing in our younger days and just, you know, we all had our little rebellious spells, but one time one of us was missing. And I remember him standing at the window and looking out. And he said, I know how that prodigal son's father felt when his son was missing. And, you know, I saw my father love all of us in a way that brought all the prodigals back home. That every one of his, his kids professed Jesus as their Savior. And he loved us all back into the fold. He was a good father, but he was even better grandfather. I mean, the, the grandkids, they could tell you story after story of how, you know, maybe he just... Let me just pull out my wallet, and maybe there's a crisp $100 bill that he hands them or uh, something that he wants to do for them. Now, I've had this tucked back for you. I gave the others something, and I, and I want to give this to you. He was constantly doing stuff like that. And then when the great-grandkids started coming, boy, he loved those. That was really what he really wanted to do was to be home and let those babies come to the house. And he, he's just a couple of days shy of getting to see see that, but he was a good father, but he was also a good leader. He, uh, they've talked about the different offices that he held within the church, and he always felt like he had something to offer, that he knew so much about the history of the denomination, so much about the way things had been done and things that had been settled years ago, and that he always thought that and felt like, and I think they will tell you the same thing. They needed him around to tell them that, that one time we did this, and this is how we did, and, and, and he, he knew all the rules and all the ins and outs, and, and he wanted to lead in the denomination. But he also led within his community. The, the chaplain staff that they have over at Northeast Georgia Medical Center, he and three other pastors started that. When we moved to Gainesville and they didn't have a, a clergy staff there, he, he and three others started that. And now they have hundreds of ministers that go in and pray with people at, at their times that they need. And, and he loved that. He, he, he loved being able to start things and organize things and, and lead and seeing it take off. But he was a good pastor. He was a great preacher, but he never took the pulpit that he was not prepared, just as Nick talked about. He, he was always prepared, and you never saw him preach on a Sunday morning that he didn't preach a gospel-centered message that could call people to come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And because of that, this week, I don't know how many people have messaged me, called me, texted me, and told me in person, but I'm, I'm saved because of your dad's preaching. He did it over and over. But, but, you know, he wasn't just a good preacher. He was also very talented organist, pianist, and singer. They talked about him leading choir at camp meeting. He, he loved to, to do that. But I remember being a kid and uh, hearing of Liberace, and, and people liked his piano playing. And, and I remember thinking in my mind, this is just the way that I held my dad, that why do people make such a big deal over that guy? My daddy is just as good. And, you know, I, I, of course, learned the difference. That, that there, there was a difference, but I'd still rather hear my daddy play <laughs> because he was tops in my book. And he was good at all these things, but it wasn't just the preaching and the singing that made him a good pastor. 
He was there for people. I remember being a little kid and him saying, son, I'm going to go over to this lady's house. You want to go with me? And I would jump in the car. You know, we were always excited to get to go somewhere with him and, and jump in the car to go over to this little lady's home. And he said, her car's not running right. We'd pull up at her house, and he'd get the keys to her little car that, that just puttered to the grocery store and just puttered to church. And uh, we would get in the car, and we would drive out of her driveway real respectful, drive around the corner real respectful, and we would get out of earshot of her house. He would say, son, there's nothing wrong with this car. It just needs to be driven. And then he would put the hammer down. <laughs> and... And we would just blow all the junk out of that old car, you know, that, that always just kind of puttered where it was going. And so when we, we would get the stuff blown out of it and take it back, and that car ran right. And I don't know if she ever knew what he did to fix it, but she's just happy her car's running right. He served the people of his church with his giftings. I thought of uh, in the early 90s, he built himself a home, and then he built me a home. He built my sister a home, my brother a home. He, uh, he, then other couples in the church that, that maybe, you know, being a young couple starting out, it'd be hard to really afford a church and uh, afford a, a home. And he would help young couples. He'd say, now I'll contract that. Just, just cover my expenses, you know. And, and I don't know how many people he helped get into their first home because he was just loving like that. But then he took those skills that he learned from building those homes and built buildings, one of which you're sitting in today and another that's just right over there through the connector for you. Another one that he built in Habersham at Bethel Temple. He, he loved to build things, and he was, he was uh, gifted at that. But then he didn't just build buildings. He built men. I stand here today as a product of someone who has had countless hours poured into me. Things that when he took me to the hospital and, and he would say, now, son, now, now the doors with this color is the ones that's the stairs. And he, he, would, he would point things out and take you through the hospital and teach you how to visit people and, and take you through a funeral. Now, son, the, the ministers stand here when they're moving the body. He, just all the protocols that he would, he would teach. But he didn't just pour into me. He poured into all these other young guys that that today Tony, Pastor Tony Elrod, Pastor John Belanger, and Pastor Nick Dalton that was up here before me, those are three men that have very thriving churches that are, that are building the kingdom of God. And he took great pride in knowing that he had helped to pour into them, to launch them into a place where they could go on and do great things for the kingdom. He never wanted to hold them back. I've heard him tell them on more than one occasion. He said, now, now when you leave here, and he knew they would leave one day, he said, when you leave me, I want you to leave for something better. And I want to help you be able to leave for something better one day. And so then he was also there when people were sick. Countless hours he spent at the hospital, always visiting people and always praying with people. And then when he would pray with those people, Many times he would lead those people to the Lord. He, he, he led people to the Lord with his preaching, but he led people to the Lord one-on-one. I, I think of in building these two buildings, I don't even know how many times that he told me, you know, one of the construction workers wanted to talk to him, and he would lead a construction worker that was building a church building, lead them to the Lord. He uh, did great, as I said, at funerals. He preached over 1,300 funerals. And you want to know how I know that number? He told us. He kept up with it. And he he could name you people. I mean, I've not done, I've probably not even hit 100 funerals. And I can't even tell you all of them. And he could could say, yeah, I I preached their mother's funeral. I preached their grandmother's funeral. And and he, he could remember so much because he loved being able to minister to people as they were hurting I told him one time, I stood right here in this pulpit when I was wanting to say something to him, and I, and I did a message to tell him the stuff that I wanted to make sure I got to say to him. And this is the statement that I said to him. I said, there's a lot of great speakers. There's a lot of great leaders. But there's not a lot of great pastors. And my dad 
Wayne Hicks was a great pastor. He really was. So in conclusion, if you'll allow me to borrow from the Reverend Charles O'Donnell, Bishop Wayne Hicks is dead, or we believe asleep, and he's gone to be with the Lord. Who was Wayne Hicks? I would tell you not to ask presidents and kings. I'd tell you not to ask the local paper how many papers they've sold because covering his death because they haven't done it. I would tell you to ask his wife of 55 years. Who was this man that loved you and cared for you and provided all that he could for you? I would tell you to ask his children the legacy that he left. Ask his sister the, the, the man that, that, that she began, got to love for all of her life. I would tell you to ask his grandchildren, his nieces, his nephews that knew he was on his way to heaven and knew that he wanted them to join him there one day. I'd tell you to ask the chaplain at the hospital what kind of difference it makes when somebody goes in and prays with a family in a hard time. I would tell you to ask the middle-aged couple that has been living in their home for over 20 years now what a difference it made to have somebody help them be able to get in that home. I would tell you to to ask the saint now that's that's been in church for many years how their life has changed because they're on their way to heaven because of the preaching of an old-time preacher man. I would tell you to ask the family that this beloved member had passed away what kind of difference it made for a man to love on them in their time of need. I tell you to ask me, because he wasn't just my dad. He was my hero. Who was Bishop Wayne Hicks? He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Could we pray together? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this good man I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to be raised by such greatness and to be able to have him in my life for 51 and a half years I thank you for all he's poured into me but not just into me but all the ones that are represented here today and ones that are probably watching online Father I pray that you'll just undergird our family today Lord, as I've heard him so many times, he says, we're, we've taken this body as far as we can take him. But Lord, I pray that you'll undergird this family. And Lord, as in the days and the months and the years to come, we're going to miss him immensely. But Father, I pray that you'll just help us to, to rest in the fact of knowing that he left a legacy that is unparalleled. I pray you'll just bless every person here who's grieving to let us look to you. And take our comfort and our strength from you. Bless my mother, my brothers, and my sister, and my nieces and nephews, and my children as they say goodbye to their grandfather. I pray you'll just help us all in the days and the years to come. And Father, I pray if there would be one of these that are here today that's a, a family member, or maybe they're not a family member, and they don't know this Jesus that Daddy preached about so long, Awaken their heart today. Quicken them. And let them, before this day is over, know you as Savior and Lord of their life and be headed one day to the place where they can be with Dad when we reunite in heaven. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.